Hi folks, welcome to Inktober Day 18. Today's prompt is Orpheus and Eurydice. And this one is a little bit different in style to the previous ones. I tried something a little bit new, so I hope you enjoy it. The new thing I tried out with this one was using masking fluid a little bit more. So I had used this in one previous one. I used it for Medusa with uh, varied effects. The, the problem with that was that I had used the masking fluid, which repels any ink and keeps the paper white. Uh, I'd used it over the top of black ink and that actually removed some of the black ink underneath. This is a different type of paper to the, the Medusa one, so I think it's a bit hardier and the, the masking fluid worked much better on this one. However, I did have a few issues with it, which you will see. Um, it's more to do with not covering all of it properly or thoroughly enough, uh, which was kind of difficult to do. And um, as you can see, in some places it's quite thick. And then when you try to thin it out, you end up with little holes. Um, and I didn't fill in the whole middle bit either. But yeah, but apart from that, it did work pretty well. I planned this one out ahead of time on um, on my iPad, so I did it digitally, and I'll show you the comparison between the two a bit later because I think it's interesting to see how the, the traditional media works versus digital and you know, both have their merits. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, the, the story here is Orpheus and Eurydice, which is a terribly sad story. It's probably one of the most tragic stories from, from Greek mythology, I think. Um, mostly because it's so to do with sort of human folly. Um, so Orpheus, Orpheus I guess isn't strictly human, but you know, he, he's a son of Apollo, which means he's really good at music and poetry, and that's kind of his thing. And I believe Eurydice is a wood nymph, and they they fall in love and I think there are different versions where sometimes they get married and sometimes they're about to get married and Eurydice gets bitten by a snake and is killed. I'm not sure if the snake is sent by one of the gods. That seems like a likely thing. Uh, but in the versions I read uh, to revise just before this, uh, it, that wasn't the case. But, you know, wouldn't be surprised if it was some vengeful god. Um, let me know in the comments if you know of a version where it is. And yeah, so she dies. Orpheus is absolutely distraught and he decides that this isn't good enough and he's going to go to the underworld and he's going to go and try and get Eurydice back. So because he plays his lyre so beautifully, he is able to uh, get past Cerberus, the three-headed dog. So if you're familiar with the scene in Harry Potter where um, Quirrell sets up the, the harp and where um, Harry plays uh, a, a pipe, or one of them plays a pipe in, in the book to send Fluffy to sleep, that is taken directly from this myth. And yeah, so he gets past Cerberus, he gets past um, Charon, who is the uh, the ferryman, uh, by singing him a song. And he makes his way to the sort of bowels of the underworld where King Hades himself lives with his queen Persephone. And... I mean, they're, they're not very impressed by the fact that he's there, for, for starters, because, um, you know, Orpheus isn't dead. Only dead people are supposed to go to the underworld. But Orpheus sings the most beautiful song of, of love and despair, and Hades is moved to allow Orpheus to return to the mortal world with Eurydice. There is one condition, of course, as there always seem to be in these myths, and they always seem to be, you know, a, a little bit arbitrary, but, you know, there's a test. And the, the test is that he has to walk back to the, the mortal world and he mustn't look back. He mustn't look back to check that Eurydice is there. And 
so it, it's a long walk and Orpheus walks and walks and doesn't look back. He can't hear anything behind him and he is worried that Eurydice isn't there at all and it's all been a trick. Just before he gets to the entrance to the model world, he glances back and of course Eurydice is there and at that moment she is lost forever. And that is what I've depicted here is the moment where Orpheus looks back and the two of them are torn apart. So I have gone for a, a kind of explosive depiction of this. I've seen this, this moment depicted in many different ways and I wanted it more of a sense of... I, I somehow always imagine them almost floating from the underworld to the, to the mortal world um, and that it's sort of being a, a between realms kind of experience so rather than it being just a simple path or them climbing up a hill it's this I don't know that Orpheus is almost flying to this to, to the model world uh, followed by Eurydice and yes so here we have the moment where they are torn apart and uh, I, I won't tell the rest of the story because I'm running out of time here um, but I do recommend looking it up because it does have, if not a happy ending, it has a, um, it has a conclusion to it. It's not exactly happy. It doesn't involve Orpheus getting torn to shreds, but, um, they are eventually reunited in, in the underworld. And, um, yeah, so as I said, this one is a, a little bit different looking to some of the others just because I tried this different technique, but I think it worked really well and here's me trying to move the camera around so that you can see this lovely peeling of the the masking tape because it's so satisfying it's one of my favorite favorite bits it's the, the sort of reward that you get at the end of doing a piece like this it's, it's got very clean lines and yeah as you'll see well as you saw before I used a kind of flicking method to get the the gold paint everywhere and I used a little bit of silver as well just to give it a little bit more depth and that was that was new I got ink all over my fingers and it this this one was quite messy actually you can see bits on the table as well which probably won't come off but it's okay um yep yeah, so it's not entirely clean as I said with the where the masking fluid was there are a few uh smudges on them but you know, that's what makes it uh, a traditional piece, I guess. You can also see a little bit of the red that I used with that pencil underneath, but I actually think that adds a little bit of oomph to it as well. Um, it, it contrasts with, with the blue and makes the, the text stand out more, so I didn't go back in and try to remove that or paint over it. Yeah, poor Orpheus. Oh. Yeah, this is certainly one of those myths that really gets to me. It's not exactly very empowering. It doesn't really say good stuff about human nature, but hey ho. Um, <laughs> so here we are. This is the on on the right, of course, is the iPad version of it that I did ahead of time. It's a lot cleaner, but it doesn't have the same energy and uh, sense of randomness to it, I guess, that the um, the painted one has so just interesting to see how those two things compare anyway that's Orpheus and Eurydice I'll go back to myself to sign off so that was Orpheus and Eurydice I'm, I'm pretty pleased with how this turned out it was interesting to see how it compared with my plan for it and how working in traditional media compares to working digitally uh, tomorrow's prompt is Ganymede which I must say I'm really pleased with how this one's turned out. Uh, like I've said before, I'm a bit ahead of myself, so I've already finished this one, and I think it might be my favourite yet. So I will love you and leave you, and see you tomorrow. And if you want to be notified about these videos, you can subscribe and hit the, the bell button. That's something you can do if you want to. Um, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>